All right, praise the Lord, everybody. Round number two. <laughs> I'm so honored to be up here before you all, and I, and I want to thank Pastor and his family. They've, they've been life-changing in our lives, and I love them all. And Can we give it up for them just real quick again? Give it up for our pastor. I mean, the dedication that he has, I've just, I've never, I've never seen it. And he's just an example for all of us to follow. And I truly admire that. And so I want to give him honor where that honor is due. And so without further ado, I want to go right into the word of God. Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter four. And we're going to start at verse 14. So then we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Next, I want to go to John chapter 1, verse number 16. We're going to start there. John chapter 1, verse 16. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. Today's message and title is called The Man of God. The Man of God. Pastor, would you lead us in prayer? Come on, church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you, Lord God, for your mercy, for your kindness, for your grace showed toward us, Lord. I pray right now, Brother Larry, Lord, that your anointing would rest upon him, Lord God. Let it destroy every yoke of the enemy here tonight, Lord. Help him, Lord God, to preach under the unction of the Holy Ghost, Lord, for the edification of the body and the perfecting of the saints, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that demons would tremble, Lord God, as your word is preached today, Lord. I pray that deliverance would come, Lord God. I pray the revelation would rest upon this place, that your glory would manifest among us, Lord God. We surrender this service over to you right now, praying that you would have your way, giving you all the glory, giving you all the honor and the praise that the church said in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The man of God. Jesus Christ is the expressed image of the invisible God. He is the heartbeat of God. If you wanted to know how God spoke, thought, or felt, you look to Jesus. He carried all the attributes of God. He was holy as God is holy. Everything that God is was in Christ Jesus. And it's interesting, and I want to start with John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was in the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Where before you couldn't see God... Because he was a spirit, now you could see him, and we beheld his glory. John 1.14 says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the two sections I want to focus on is the light that shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In the Old Testament... Before, you couldn't, you couldn't see God. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You couldn't see God. And so in the Old Testament, when sin came into the world, darkness was present because God is love. And, and so as darkness prevailed through the world, man became more separated from God, just as death became separated from light itself. And as darkness continues to grow and each generation becomes more wicked than the next, we find that humanity is starting to move further away from God. But thanks be to God, 
and his unfailing love that he robed himself in flesh, was persecuted, beaten for our transgressions, wounded, and by his stripes we are healed. He came and he loved us. And he was the light that shined in the darkness, and that darkness couldn't be comprehended because they were so far removed from God's love. They couldn't recognize that God was right there in front of them, in flesh. Here comes Jesus, robed in flesh, saying, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the door of the sheephold. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus comes walking on water. And I was telling some of the brothers this. Genesis 1 was flashing right before their eyes, and they couldn't even see it. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void. And God's spirit moved upon the face of the deep, and he said, let there be light. And Jesus is the light of the world. And so Jesus wasn't walking on water just as a flex. Jesus came walking on that water and said, I am. I am here. God was walking right in front of them, and, Jesus, and Genesis was unfolding. They couldn't see it. God was in flesh. And oftentimes he would rebuke the Pharisees because the love was so separated, their heart wasn't right. The Pharisees were masters of the law at the time. They could probably quote the scripture to you backwards and forwards, the first five books of the, the, first five books of the law, Law of Moses, masters of the scripture. And yet they didn't have it right because the heart was off. Because what the law couldn't do, only Jesus could do. Only God could do. And so, because God entered the world, we now have victory through Christ Jesus. And so now that we understand, we know that God is love. And why the Pharisees could not see him because they were so far separated. They couldn't understand what was right in front of them. And they were getting rebuked left and right. Jesus comes turning their whole world upside down. He's healing on the Sabbath. And he was like, why are your apostles eating? And why, why don't you fast? And why don't you do all these things? And we're keeping the law. What, what are you saying? They tried to trip him up. And, and they would try to use the law of Moses against him. But the essence of the law and the prophets is love. Jesus would come and tell them the first two commandments. Love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is like an unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the Pharisees knew that there was one God. By that time, idolatry had pretty much been wiped out. They didn't have that problem anymore throughout the Old Testament. God had delivered them up to their enemies. But at that time, they knew that there was one God. But the problem was... They didn't understand love. They didn't have the revelation of love. And so they were treating their brethren wrongly. And Jesus had to come rebuke them. And oftentimes in today's age, as the world gets colder and colder, we have to hold close to that revelation of God through his love through Jesus Christ. And sometimes when we forget that and we only talk about the man of God on Easter Sunday... And we're concentrated on the power of God. We're praying for revival. We're praying for demons to get cast out. We're praying for that strong arm of God. And yet sometimes we do that and our heart could be far from him. And so it's important to realize and keep in mind God's will and his love. And what I, the first point I want to talk about is that he knows your infirmities. And sometimes, whether it's because of shame or lack of trust, we, we don't really come to him with the things that plague us. When was the last time you said out loud the thing that plagues your mind or the thing that's in your heart that you're so scared to bring to him? Or even before your brethren and you hide from him. It's that image you try to maintain before him like you do in front of others. And you want to keep your dignity before God, right? Right? Because I want to keep my dignity, right? I don't want to see God. I don't want God to see me undignified. I can't be naked before him because he's so far up there, and here I am so far down here. I'm ashamed to come to him. And because I'm ashamed of my struggles, and I feel like he doesn't understand them because they're so far beneath him, and he's only concerned with maybe punishing me, and we're we come in fear sometimes. Because we say to him, and we have that mindset, will you strike me like you struck the Egyptian? 
Will you take your spirit from me like you took Saul so it's better for me to hide it, knowing that he knows anyway? Ooh. Mm. Mm. And so we don't understand that he was tempted in all points, just as we are. And sometimes I catch myself like, Lord, did you go through this thing specifically? Were you troubled in your mind like this? Were you ever afflicted like this? But the word says he was tempted in all points, and there is nothing new under the sun. So we can trust him. And moreover, the man of God wasn't, wasn't somebody we can't relate to. He took the form of a servant, a lowly servant, someone that wasn't physically super strong or mighty. He was just like you and me. And yet he was still able to overcome. And the man of God knows what it's like to be affected in his mind, body, and spirit. He was tempted by the devil in his mind. Forty days, no food or water. He had the option to take the easy way out, but he still overcame. And, of course, we know he was afflicted in his body. Cat at nine tails on his back, crown of thorns on his head, beaten. They put a bag over his head, prophesy unto me who hit you. In every single sense, in his mind, body, and spirit, he faced the biggest obstacles that we ever would, more than we ever would. And in his spirit, he was grieved many times by the unbelief from the very people he came to save, mind, body, and spirit. And so our fear that we have in coming to God is not of God. Name one person who was scared to come to Jesus for anything, knowing that they were sick and needed healing, knowing that they needed a physician, Nobody was scared. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So when we find ourselves fearing, it's a love problem. It's a connection problem. There's something missing. And sometimes we, we come here and we worship and Standing and we're, and we're praying afar off and we're speaking the words and, and we're praying for all the things we know to pray for. And God's like, yes, pray for those things. Pray for revival. Pray for, pray for souls to be saved. But when are you going to come talk to me about that lust you've been struggling with all week? When are you going to talk to me about that alcohol you were tempted to drink last week or that thing that you're not quite over that you've been carrying for 10 years? That's great. But when are you going to come to me with that? That's the man of God. That is the heart of God. Mm. Mm. And so we forget the man of God sometimes. We forget the heartbeat of God. The Lord said in Isaiah, let us reason together. Though your sins be red as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That same God comes in the flesh later in Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And so we have to come to him. He does not, he's not, he can understand everything that goes on with us. There's nothing new under the sun. And this is something I had to really get a revelation of, because sometimes I feel that way, that I can't go to God with this because I'm either ashamed or I'm afraid of what he's going to do to me. And so that's imperfect, that's imperfection in love. And I realized I forgot the man of God. I forgot how he walked this earth. I forgot the love of God, the revelation of the love of God, which still covers us all. The same God that said, I would never leave you nor forsake you. And lo, I am with you always until the end of the earth. Ooh, Lord. And I want to go into my second point. Not only did he come in the flesh and was he tempted in all manners you were, But he also overcame. He overcame so you can too. The war has already been won. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That victory was made manifest when he rose from the dead. You are not without hope. In Revelation 1.18, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys to hell 
and of death. To hell and of death. The things you fear the most. The things that are so far above what you will ever face in this world, he has the keys of. He comes dangling the keys. That same man of God that came as the servant who was beaten, the devil thought he had him won, but then he rose from the dead in the full glory of Almighty God. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end of all things, the first and the last. Mm. Ooh, the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon. My God. Even in Revelation 5, John sees a book. He sees a vision in heaven. He sees a book in the right hand of him who's sitting on the throne. And no one was worthy to open the book. No, not man in heaven or earth or under the earth. And John starts weeping because that book is the book of life. And we would, if we don't have the book of life, it's over for us. We're doomed. John starts weeping. But then an angel comes over to him and says, why are you crying? Fear not. The lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed and is worthy to open the book. My God. And you see Jesus Christ. He looks up again. He sees the Lamb of God in the midst of the throne as it had been slain, as it had been slain. My God, the same stripes he had on his back, the crown of thorns he had on his head, the nail-scarred hands on his feet, he still had a forever bearing testimony of what he did for us. That's why he's the high priest that forever makes intercession, because those scars are permanent, as it had been slain in the midst of the throne. Worthy to open the book. That is the hope of our calling. My God. And I want to transition to my third point. Not only did he overcome, and you can overcome too, but we are called to be like him. Psalms 2, verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And I want to focus on that section, kiss the son. See, kissing, when it says kiss the son, that is a form of submission and obedience. We have to be submitted to Jesus Christ, living the life that he lived. We are to live as Christ lived. When Christ walked this earth, he feared God. He prayed always. He did the will of the Father that sent him. He worked and he cared for others. I remember in a certain section in Matthew, he talks about how the Son of Man will come back. And in heaven, he'll separate the goats on one side and the sheep on one side. And he's going to say, and the righteous will come to him and say, when did I see you hungry? When did I see you in prison? When did I see you thirsty? When did I see you do all these things? And Jesus essentially says, the ones that you done least, the least of them that our brethren that you've done, you've done unto me. And so we have to do the same thing. But all of this is because at the end of the day, God wants to conform us to his image. He's trying to reverse everything that happened in the Garden of Eden. Because we were made in the image of God. When God looked at us, he saw himself. And what's interesting is that in Matthew 22, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the gate. And then later on, he says, and I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And one thing that always got me about this verse, how is it that the God who knows everything will look at you and say he doesn't know you? Never could figure that out. But then I, it clicked in me. He doesn't recognize himself in you. He looks at you. And he, I don't see the blood applied the precious blood that was applied over you in baptism in my name. Where's my name that's on you? Where's my spirit that's in you? For those that don't have the spirit of Christ are none of his. Where's the work you did? Why didn't you go out and defend the oppressed and, 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 and you didn't defend the poor? You didn't share your meat with the brethren and you didn't do any of these things. I don't recognize you because all the ones that did, Paul, all the apostles, there was something in them that you saw in God. So we have to become like him because that's what he's looking for. That's what gets you into the gate. Does he look at you and does he see his son when he walked in the earth? Does he see when he did all of these works and that precious blood was slain? Does he see that applied over you? 
If not, he don't recognize you. He don't know you. And so I want to put it all together. One, Jesus knows your infirmities. He understands your problems. You can go to him. Remember the man of God. If I can say for that first point, remember the man of God, how he suffered. You know the love of God through Jesus Christ. The second point, again, reiterating, that same man of God overcame. Jesus Christ is Lord God Almighty. And because he rose from the dead, as Pastor mentioned it earlier, he said, I have the power to lay my life down and the power to pick it back up again. And so, given that we have the same spirit, that same spirit that raised Christ up from the dead, we overcome and we live and walk by the spirit. And finally, I want to wrap up with that third point again. It's not all for nothing. We are doing that to become more like him, made in his image. We have to walk that walk, the same walk that he did. So that way, when we put all three together, we have his blood applied. We have his spirit on us, and we do the same works that he did. He said, greater works shall ye do. Shall ye do. So I come against every enemy that says you can't overcome. And every enemy that says you're defeated, you, can, you can't be anything like Jesus. It was commanded that you be like Jesus. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. It was a command. It's the only attribute of God he actually commanded you to be, was holy. So what the enemy says is a complete lie. The word of God tells me otherwise. And so that's what I want to leave you with. You can overcome. You have the blood of Jesus applied to you. You have his spirit living in you, so walk after the spirit. You are not a slave to sin. My God, you are not a slave to sin. And through the spirit, you can do the same works Jesus did, and he was requiring you to because that's the kingdom of God. Save the souls. Go out there. Defend the oppressed. Do unto the least, unto the least of them. And so that's what I want to conclude with. So may this word bless you all. I pray I stayed within that 15-minute window. Jesus. Was I good? And, all right. <laughs> but I'll turn it back over to Hallelujah. Pastor. Thank you so much. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, my hallelujah. Hallelujah. These brothers are no slouch. And that was a solid word from the Lord. I hope y'all don't just be dismissing what these men are up here saying. They, I'm up here taking notes myself. Like, ooh, I'm taking that. Genesis had manifested on the water. The light had moved on the face of the water as Jesus. I never thought of that before. Glory to God. And he said, I don't see me in you. Come on, man. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. But that, that, that was just the cinnamon portion of the bread. Coming with another portion, the rosemary, the rosemary parmesan bread is coming right now. Thank you, Jesus. Next man of God I'm bringing up is, is an elder here at the church. I, I, I remember when they came and, and, and they said, now, now, now look, Pastor, we, we want to work. We know, now, very few people come to church to talk about, now look, we want work. And, and the ones that have come in the past, when it's time for the work to be done, it's like, well, you know. But this, this man of God and their family, they, they, really, they really have put, put the actions behind that word. And, and not, not only that, God is using them so mightily, mightily amongst the people. The families here are saved. Amen. Witnessing to other people. And I'm telling you what. And so uh, I don't know if I can puff you up anymore. I can, but I, I might may embarrass you. But at this time, I want to bring Elder Ray to the pulpit in Jesus' name. Come on, rejoice in the Lord as he comes to preach to us. You know he called me Ella, so y'all got to give me a minute. <laughs> but praise God, we're not going to belong to time, hallelujah. Uh, you know, after 
Lord have mercy. We can go home right now, Jesus. God bless you. But at, at this time, I want you to turn with me to, uh, to Jeremiah chapter 2. And we're going to be reading uh, from the NLT tonight. Hallelujah. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. When you got it, can you say amen? Let us read. The Lord gave me another message. This is, Jer this is Jeremiah. And he said, go and shout this message to Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. And church, you know the service we had today and Brother Larry just finished and here Camilla Ray got to preach a message like this. God says, I remember how eager you were to please me. As a young bride long ago, how you loved me and followed me even through the barren wilderness. In those days, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his children. All who harmed his people were declared guilty, and disaster fell on them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Listen to what the word of the Lord, of the Lord, people of Jacob, all you families of Israel, this is what the Lord says. What did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them to stray so far from me? They worshiped worthless idols only to become worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us safely out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought and death where no one lives or even travels? And when I brought you into a fruitful land to enjoy its bounty and goodness, you defiled my land and corrupted the possession I had promised you. The priest did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who taught my word ignored me. The rulers turned against me and the prophet spoke in the name of Baal. And I want to drop down to verse 13. It says, for my people have done two evils, evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked system that can hold no water at all. I want to speak to you tonight from a subject that says the greatest mistake. Pastor, will you pray for us in Jesus' name? Heavenly Father, we love and thank you today, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you've called us to the kingdom for such a time as this, Lord. And I pray, oh God, an anointing over Elder Ray right now, Lord God, to help him, Lord God, to deliver, Lord God, your word unto us here tonight, Lord. I pray that it would edify, Lord God. I pray that it would convict, Lord God. I pray that it would change our hearts tonight, Lord God. I pray that it would not return void, Lord God, but accomplish whatever you have set out for it to do, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that the enemy be driven out from us, Lord God, and that every heart will be open to receive here tonight as your will is done in this place. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, to give you the honor and the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray that the church say amen. amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated at this time. Hallelujah. And this was a time when, when God had called Jeremiah to be a prophet. And Jeremiah, God called Jeremiah to cry out against Israel and their sin. And you know they called Jeremiah, I don't know if you heard this, but they called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. But Jeremiah, he cried out against the sin of Israel. And I just want to say tonight, chasing after other things. And other gods chasing changeable things instead of chasing the unchangeable God. And I want to go back to Jeremiah when he said, I remember how eager you were to please me. And that's where it got me in the middle of my heart. Because I remember when the God first saved me and filled me with the Holy Ghost. How I, how I was so eager. I couldn't wait to get home to tell my, my mother, my uncle. I didn't have no problem telling anybody that God did a work in my life. I might share some tears tonight. This is going to be okay. 
Because along the way, along the way, and I knew God had did this for me. And I, was, I went to work, preached, and I mean, people would tell me, I don't want to hear that, but I would tell them anyway. Right. I would tell them. It had that zeal for God. Amen. Wasn't afraid. Wasn't afraid. Stood up for God. Every, just about everybody I met, I told them something. God bless them, but it had something to do with my Lord and Savior. But somewhere passed along the way. I lost that zeal. But God said, I remember how eager you were to go and tell somebody. Some, some nights I couldn't sleep because I couldn't wait. A brother asked me a question. I couldn't wait to get back to him to work to explain to him what thus said the Lord. Would go and spend time with him after work. Tired, but I would go. Go. And now to hear pastor talking about now, we, this is what we need now. And God, this is what we need now. But I lost that along the way. I lost it. But I appreciate God today for his mercy. I thank God for his grace. But church, I tell you, you know, I have to tell you this. And, but I'm talking about the greatest mistake. You know, it's not so much a falling back into sin. That's not the greatest mistake. You know, it's a mistake, but that's not the greatest. That's not the greatest mistake. And tonight I got... I got one, I got three points, but it's, they're going to be very short tonight. And I, my first point is, don't go back in the, in, don't go back in the world. And, and scripture is going to come from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20, verses, I mean 20 through 22. And I want y'all to bear with me. And it says, and when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again. They are worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. They prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to his vomit. And another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. Church, that's what happens when we get entangled. And once again, I'm talking about me now. Because I'm going to tell you something. If we decide to go back out in this world, I'm going to tell you, they're not going to accept you back. So don't let the devil trick you and fool you in thinking that if there's a life better than this outside. Don't go back in the world. Don't go back. Point number two. When you fall, get up. Let me tell you something. Those that are godly will not allow setback. And that, we got a scripture for that. Proverbs 24 and 16. And it says, the just man, the godly, may trip. This is what the New Living Translation says. The godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. So brothers and sisters tonight, when you fall, not if you fall, but when you fall, if you're human tonight, when you fall, get back up again. Get up again. You know, Donnie McClurkin made a song that says, when you, get back up again. Get back up again. No condemnation. Get back up again. Rise up again. Don't lay there and die. Don't let the enemy whisper in your ear and tell you that it's over for you. Hallelujah. Long as you got breath inside of you. <laughs> Long as you can breathe tonight. Hallelujah. There's hope for us tonight. Long as we're breathing tonight, there is hope for South Tampa tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. And my third point tonight, this is a scripture that just wrapped itself around my heart. And it says, uh, ask for the old path. Y'all should have known something was up with Elder tonight. You know, I'm going to have to say something old, you know what I'm saying? 
But as for the old path, hallelujah. Could you pull that scripture up for me, man? Please, sir. And that's going to be coming. This scripture is coming from Jeremiah 6 and 16. Hallelujah. There it is. This is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Take a look around. And I don't know about you, but I'll tell you right now, I believe we're at that crossroad tonight. Hallelujah. Choose whom this day, who we going to serve tonight. But he says, as for the old godly way, we have not because we ask not. But he says, the old godly way and walk in it. He said, travel this path and you will, not you maybe, might. He said, but you will find rest for your souls. South Tampa, we're not going to be that last portion right there. We're not going to be that last portion. But we reply, yes, Lord. But they reply, but you reply, no, that's not the road we want. And that's what done happened to so many pastors tonight, preachers and decided to went their own way. My way is the right way. You know, I had a pastor used to tell us, it's my way or the highway. Oh, Lord, help us tonight. Lord, help us tonight. And let me tell you tonight, let me let the cat out of the bag tonight. What is the greatest mistake tonight? The greatest mistake that we'll ever make walking this Christian walk tonight. If we ever walk away, you know, uh, I think it was John 16, 6, and I think it's around about 44 when Jesus was explaining to his disciples who he were. He was trying to tell people who he was. He was the bread of life. If you eat of my, of my flesh, drink of my blood. But they said it was a hard saying. And said so many, many his disciples, they, they turned back. The greatest mistake that we'll ever make tonight if we turn back and walk no more with God. Oh, it's a mistake to fall into sin. But when you fall into it and you don't get up, you don't repent of your sin, you don't turn away from that thing, but you stay there and you die. You lay there and you die. But the greatest mistake that we'll ever make tonight, if we walk away from our Lord and Savior and don't ever return again. And that what the enemy would love for us to do tonight. Is to throw our hands up and say, I'm not going back anymore. And I'm going to be honest with you tonight, I'll tell you, not so much of what somebody did to me, but I said, Lord, this is hard. You know, I, even my job, I think about it, and I said, Lord, but I said, no, no, God, all excuses is on the cross tonight. Yeah. I got to be at work at 5 o'clock, but I tell you, if I had to be up some, to do anything else, I would be up. I would be up ready to go. But we find excuses. But I say, lad, not tonight. That is under the blood tonight. That is under the blood tonight. No more excuses. But church, tonight I encourage you, don't make the greatest mistake. Don't let the enemy get in your ear. Don't let people get in your ear. If you had to cut some people off, cut them off. If you had to cut some family members off, cut them off. Because let me finish telling the story about I was so happy to go tell my mom and, my, and go tell my uncles that I was saved, sanctified, and loving Jesus. But I had to cut them off. Because every time I went to visit, it was something negative. It was something negative. Oh, boy, that don't, I don't want to hear that mess. <laughs> okay. I said, all right. Then mom asked me, what, son? You don't come by and see me no more. And I wish I was a lot strong at the time. And I would, wish I could went to see my mom more. And just don't worry about and block out what she was saying. But I was young. I couldn't take it. Because I didn't want nothing to come between me and what God had given me. I didn't want anything to come between that. But somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, I got tired. Didn't have that zeal to go to church anymore. I went, but I was just there. Oh, I was in the house. I was in there. I'm talking about way before church started. I was there cleaning up, doing all that. But when it came down to what, what meant the most, didn't have no desire. Didn't have no desire. 
But thanks be to God tonight. Thanks be to God tonight. That hallelujah. That he gave me another opportunity to know him. Hallelujah. To know that to hear, O Israel, to hear will tonight, hallelujah, that the Lord our God, he is one God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But church, don't make that mistake. Don't make that greatest. Don't make that mistake, but it will happen. But don't make that greatest mistake. If you fall, get up. If you stray away, come back. If you have to cut some people to lose, cut them loose. And I'm going to tell you, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing. Just like the disciples told Jesus, Lord, that's, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to do when you have to cut your family off. That's tough. But I mean Jesus all the way. I mean Jesus all the way. And I appreciate my pastor and his wife so much for the stand that they take for God. I'm telling you, hallelujah. I lift up God tonight for them. I appreciate God for him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I don't know if my time is up or not, but that's all I have for you tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. And pastor, I give it over to you, sir. Praise God. Whoa. Don't make the greatest mistake. That man said, if you fall, he didn't say even if, he said when you fall. We don't like to say that in church services, but you're going to fall. You're going to fall. Sometimes the fall is going to hurt. When you fall, that devil will be right there whispering in your ear. Jesus, get up. God loves you. I'm not going to re-preach this sermon, but I, I thank you, Elder, for coming and sharing your heart with us. And, uh, and I'm so glad that you found your zeal back in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. Remain standing. I'm, I, I got a popcorn word for you tonight. You know, because popcorn is quick. Amen. I'm going to stay in the book of Jeremiah. And I'm going to go to Jeremiah 30. Amen. While you turn and clap your hands for these men of God. have no doubt that many of them will go on to, if the Lord tarries, will go on to pastor, go on to be evangelists, go on to be leaders in various rights. And, you know, I, I know you're probably looking at me like, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. But, and I thought the same thing about 10 years ago. And look at me now. <laughs> well, I say to you, men and future men and women of God, just let the Lord have his way in your life. Because his plan is much better than what we think. All right. I, uh, not Isaiah. Jeremiah chapter 30. Um, and I'm going to just start in the first, uh, um, excuse me, verse number four. This is in the King James Version. And these are the words that the Lord spoke, spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling of fear and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? And all faces are turned into paleness. That was a rhetorical question. Obviously men don't give birth. I know that's a revelation in these days. But in the Bible it was a rhetorical question. He's saying that men are holding their stomachs like they're about to give birth. I'm in verse uh, right before. Oh, I didn't have a verse up there. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Everybody said Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck. And will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him, but they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Interesting, Jeremiah was born after David, but he's saying that Jacob is going to serve David, and Jacob was born before David. 
who is this David that the Lord is going to raise up, I wonder. Mm, there you go. Praise God. We just shouted his name all the evening. Therefore, fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Today I want to talk to you from this topic, Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. This scripture is a prophecy concerning obviously Jacob. Um, but in this context, Jacob is not referring to the man Jacob. The term Jacob is referring to the children that came from Jacob. It's not referring to the man Jacob. It's referring to the 12 sons that he had that eventually came the 12 tribes of, of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob. Um, so when, when Jeremiah is dealing with Jacob in this context, the word Jacob is meant to speak for the whole nation. Okay. And it, tem it tells you about Jacob's trouble. Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. This is referring to Jacob when he was with Laban. Anybody remember that story? Raise your hand if you remember that story. Jacob had stolen. Uh, he had tricked his brother out of the birthright and stolen the blessing uh, from his father that was supposed to go to uh, Esau. And as a consequence, Esau wanted to kill him. He wanted to take his brother's life because Jacob had the blessing. Let me pause right here to say anytime you have a blessing, the enemy's after you. Some people hate you just because you're anointed. Some people at your job just can't stand you just because you got the Holy Ghost. And they know you got there's something different with you. And you're wondering what is the beef and what is the problem. That's Esau hunting you, wanting to kill you because you got a blessing that they don't got. It is what it is. Amen. So Jacob had to flee and go to Laban's house uh, at the direction of his father. And, and it, it was okay there. He found his first wife, uh, which was supposed to be Rachel. And then, you know, old, old, uh, tender eyed Leah was snuck in there before. Praise God, and, 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 and she was not loved, so she produced children first, and Rachel was loved, so God struck her barren. Um, that's really a prophetic foreshadowing of the Gentile church being saved before uh, the Jews was, was be saved, because Leah would produce much more children first before Rachel would produce her first, which was Joseph, and the first one she did produce would be the savior of them later on, speaking about Jesus coming from that. So uh, during this time is when Jacob exploded. <laughs> He had seven babies by Leah, two babies by Bilha, two babies by Zilpa, two babies by uh, Rachel. Man had 12. You think your life is bad. You think your family's messed up. This man had two, two wives and two baby mamas in the same household fighting. This is not even his trouble yet. We ain't even got to the trouble yet. Just his home life. There's one portion of scripture where, where Rachel wanted to buy some time. <laughs> we'll try to take the mandrakes. And, and, and then Leah was like, you already took my husband. You're going to take my mandrakes too? <laughs> They're beefing. There's other times where the sons are beefing between one another because they all have different mothers. And so you know how it is. You're in the same house and your mama's different from my mama. And your mama's the servant of my mama. Yeah, that's going to be up. That's going to be fight. So they, they butted heads a whole lot. And that's the family of God, y'all. Those are the 12 tribes of Israel. Their names are going to be written on the new heaven and heavenly Jerusalem that comes out of the sky. That dysfunctional, messed up family. And so I think if God can save that family and use that family, surely God can be with our families. Amen. So during this time, he exploded. And these two women that he married were, were Laban's daughters. And so as, a, as, a, as a, a payment for their hand in marriage, he was forced to work under Laban. Seven years for Leah, which he didn't really plan on. But seven years for, for uh, Jacob. Amen. So, uh, men, you're going to have to work for your wife. Yeah. Come on, come on, baby. Hallelujah. Let another wife say amen. <laughs> seven years. Let somebody come calling on Ileana or Annalise. You got to work seven years, brother. I can, or pay me seven years worth of, worth of finances. How much you make? 50K a year? I'm going to go ahead and need you to run me that real quick. Praise God. Seven years. What's seven times? $3,500. $3, come on, run that. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Either you're going to have to pray for your daddy. <laughs> he made him work. And, and it started off good. Yeah. Started off okay. But, but, but then, right around the time that Joseph was born, Laban's countenance changed towards yeah. Jacob. Because yeah. God had dealt with Jacob that his time under Laban was done. Because Laban's house was not in the promised land. Laban's house was out. He had to leave the promise to go to Laban. Which is a representation of the Jews leaving their promise. And prospering and multiplying in foreign nations. But there's coming a time and the time is here. Where God is calling them to come back to Bethel. We're coming back home to Bethel. So right as Joseph is being born, God speaks to Jacob and says, it's time for you to leave Laban's house. And as soon as he tells Laban, I'm getting ready to leave, Laban's countenance turns towards Jacob. Everything was cool before, but now that he's getting ready to leave, Laban knows his blessing is getting ready to leave. Laban knows his financial blessing is getting ready to leave. He knows his herds are going to dwindle and his flocks are going to dwindle because Jacob is blessing, is blessing Laban. The blessing on his life is blessing Laban's life, and Laban's all about that money. And so he don't want Jacob to leave at all. And furthermore, he's leaving with his daughters. And so the Bible says he starts to treat Jacob evil. His countenance is evil. He changes his wages ten times. Ten times. And the whole time, God keeps blessing him. God keeps turning it around. God keeps causing Jacob's stuff to multiply. And God keeps blessing him. And God keeps blessing him. And I'm telling you, there's nothing the enemy can do to you. Every plan is going to fail. Even though it might seem like it's not, it's going to fail. It's going to be turned around. God said he'll drive your enemy away from you seven ways. So you don't have to worry about anything the enemy does on your behalf. God is going to fight for you and cause the plan of the enemy to reverse to coming on your behalf. And so everything that Laban tried to do to Jacob, God would turn it around and bless him. Uh, I'm going to take these sheep, then God would bless the other kind of sheep. And I'm going to take the ring spotted, and God would bless those. Uh, I'm going to take the black sheep, and then God would bless those. Uh, so much to the point of Laban scratching his head, looking to his servants like, what's going on? And they're like, God keeps blessing Jacob. You cannot curse what God has blessed. There is no curse that will work against Jacob. This is, a very, this is a very troubling time for Jacob, though. Very troubling time. He was afflicted during this time. Then he tried to leave and go back. And oh, my word. Now Laban's all about his money. And so he has to, he pursues after Jacob. Read the story. Here comes Jacob traveling with all his herds, uh, uh, all these wives and baby mamas, with all these kids. That right there drive me crazy. <laughs> I've taken a road trip just from, from Florida to Indiana before with my kids in the car. I said, Lord, have mercy. I can imagine carrying a caravan of, 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 of four fighting women with 12 fighting sons. Good night. No, that enough with a call. I'm going to Bethel by myself, y'all. <laughs> y'all tripping. <laughs> and if that wasn't bad enough, who is chasing him, trying to kill him? Laban. And even furthermore, he believes when he gets back to the promise that Esau is going to kill him. So he's between a rock and a hard place. Oh, Jacob's trouble. Now, why am I telling you this? That's what Jeremiah is referring to. He's saying in the same time and the same manner that Jacob suffered trouble coming back to his promised land, Israel will suffer trouble from the world when they come back to their promised land. And what are they calling Israel today? You Zionist. You, the o o occupiers is what they call them. You took the land. You kicked people off of the land. Poor Palestinians, you're treating them horrible. The world is turning their back against the Jews. The world is coming against them. We sing it on a large scale. Largest terrorist attack that's happened in years happened to them on October the 7th. And people are on the side of the terrorists. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about what well, everybody really, is, any life that's lost is a tragedy. I agree. But if you terrorize my house, you. If you come and kill a thousand people and kidnap 250 more, you're going to have some hell to pay. I'm just trying to tell you. 
But that shows you the spirit that is in this world been released right now. This is what Jeremiah is prophesying about. He's telling us that in these last days, right at the point that God will, will bring judgment to all nations, Jacob is going to suffer trouble. Now, I bring this to you today because I've been speaking a lot. About, I've tried to get away from this, but stuff just keeps happening. So last time I talked to you, it was about the red heifers. I gave you the sign. We, we talked about what that meant scripturally, that the red heifers would cleanse the priests and prepare them for sacrifice in the temple, which the Jews are ready to build. And I told you that the enemy does not want them to do this, and it's going to stir things up, and there will be attacks come. And lo and behold, just a few days ago, a couple days ago, Iran launched hundreds of missiles into Israel. I think it was last night. Yesterday, their time is different. I'm not sure of the timing exactly. And we knew it was going to happen. Every spiritual eye was like, mm, that sacrifice is going to stir some things up. Glory to God. It's stirring things up. And they did it as retaliation because uh, Israel came against, I think it was one of their embassies. And so they launched hundreds of missiles. And the Iron Dome is just swiping missiles out the sky. America's forces are helping to swipe missiles out of the sky. I think some other nations join in to try to help them to defend. And people are upset that they are defending themselves from the missiles. Like you should just let them hit you. People are, Americans are mad at America for helping to defend the missiles from hitting the ground. Talking about, we don't need to be involved. Like what kind of idiotic statement if you have the capability to, I thought every tra life loss is a tragedy. It turns out the world doesn't think that when it comes to Christian or Jews or babies. You can kill in many, any one of those groups as you want. But you better not kill a dog. You better not hurt whale. Free Willie's got to live. Save the turtles. No. It's stupidity. That preacher preaches. Darkness comprehended. This world is dark. It is dark. And so here we are. Jacob is going through trouble right now. Now here's where we are politically. Iran has vowed that if America gets involved, they will retaliate on American embassies in the region. They have vowed that. Israel, as of today, has vowed to retaliate against those hundreds of missiles that were fired. This is war. We have entered into prophetic fulfillment of Jacob's trouble, which means this. Jesus is coming. Amen. Amen. That's what we're looking for. But here's the thing. What happens in the natural is also mirroring what's happening in spiritual. In the same way that there is a war in the natural, you better believe there is a war in the spirit. In the same way that enemy was launching hundreds of missiles or towards Israel in order to take them down, you better believe the devil is launching hundreds of missiles, fiery darts, fiery darts of the wicked and calling this to distract you to take away your zeal. Fiery darts of the wicked to get you complacent and, and just a lack of days ago with the things of God. Fiery darts mentally to get you mentally afflicted and depressed and sad. My God, last week in the middle of the week, the devil hit me so hard with depression. I'm driving. I'm like, what in the world? Why am I? I'm crying. I don't even know why I'm crying. I'm saying, woe is me. The whole way home, I'm crying. I'm like, what in the world is this? And I got the revelation. It's time. The devil's trying to take me out. He's trying to take me out. I got my mind made up. You're not taking me out. You're not taking me out. Because in the same way Israel's got an iron dome, I got a shield of faith. I got my shield of faith. 
When everything looks bleak, I just raise my faith high to Jesus because he's the author and he's the finisher of my faith. He's the one that called me. He's the one that filled me. He's the one that saved me. He's the one that anointed me. He's the one that healed my body. He's the one that called me out of darkness into my marvelous light. So I'm telling you here today, you can fire as many missiles as you want to, but I got news for you. No weapon formed against me will be able to prosper. I'll stay in my right mind. I'll keep preaching this word of God and I'm not going to take it sitting down. You better believe we're going to retaliate. Devil, you got another thing coming. This is war in the spirit. This is war for the souls. Israel's going through war. You better believe the church is going through war. Israel is going through trouble. You better believe the church is going through trouble. But just like Jacob wrestled with that angel and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I believe there's a hunger in the people of God to grab a hold to God and say, Lord, I'm not going to let you go until I see revival. I'm not going to let you go until I see harvest. I'm not going to let you go until I see my family saved. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Until you anoint us. Until you favor us. Until you change our name. And I'm telling you God is honoring us. He will not suffer us to be harmed. He said nothing by any means shall harm you. We're going to take territory in Jesus name. I'm telling you there's war in the spirit there's war in the spirit that's why we're praying in the morning now in the church because there's war in the spirit that's why you need to start fasting and getting your consecration up because there's war in the spirit oh glory to God oh glory to God the devil's firing missiles at us, uh, trying to get us to waver, uh, trying to get us to lay down, uh, trying to get us to stay down uh, and not get back up. Uh, oh, he's trying to get us not to come to God uh, and bear our infirmities out before him. Uh, he's trying us to forget the infirmities that he faced. Uh, he's trying to get us to forget your testimony. Uh, he wants you to forget your blessing. Uh, he wants you to forget all that God has done for you. Uh, he wants you to focus on the negative, uh, focus on the bad, uh, focus on the depressing. Uh, Hallelujah, Jesus. But you got to have a mind made up tonight that I will not let these fiery darts of the wicked penetrate my heart. I will not let them penetrate my family. I will not let them penetrate my neighborhood. I stand as a guard and with the angel covering her as a hedge of protection around us, covering us in the name of Jesus. But we will execute warfare. And with God on our side, we will prevail. Because he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm telling you, take up your sword, church. Take up your armor, church. Take up the battle, church. Get in the warfare position because the enemy is coming in like a flood. But the Lord will raise up a standard against him. I'm telling you, we've got a fight to fight. We are soldiers in the army of the Lord. We are joining in with the heavenly host. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Uh, whatever you loose on earth uh, shall be loosed in heaven. Uh, and I'm telling you here today, uh, we've got power. Uh, we've got authority. Uh, we've got anointing uh, to take the territory back. Oh, glory, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. I put this in the atmosphere. Anything you've been afflicted with, we're going to release it today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Some of those missiles might have made it through. You hear me? Some of those missiles might have made it through. But we're going to repent. We're going to get back up as the man of God has said. We're going to come forward. And we're going to see what the Lord will do. Hallelujah, Jesus. Because the battle's not over. It's not over until the Lord has the last word. Glory to God. And we're going to let those shield of faith come high. And keep us in our mind. Keep us in our
in our families. I come against every mental affliction right now in the name of Jesus. If you've been suffering mentally, maybe you were like me and you went through hell mentally this week. I want you to just begin to lift up your hands and to begin to rebuke that in Jesus' name and say, no, devil, you don't get this territory. You don't get this mind. We're not surrendering it. We're not surrendering it. How do those summer? You might have got one blow in, but we're not gonna let you prevail. We've got power through the Spirit of God. We've got authority through the Spirit of God. We've got authority in the name of Jesus. Oh glory, God. Oh glory, God. We're gonna keep on witnessing. We're gonna keep on testifying. We're gonna keep on interceding. We're gonna keep on praying. We're gonna keep on worshiping. We're going to keep on praising her. We're going to keep on lifting up the name of Jesus. Because that's what the devil really wants. He wants to shut us up. He wants to call us to be quiet. He wants to cause us to sit down. He wants to just take your line down. But the devil is a liar. And we're calling him out today. For this kingdom belongs to us. We've got it by covenant. We've got it by the spirit of God. Come on, come on. Everything that he lost you, everything that he lost against us, we rebuke it in Jesus' name. Every distraction, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. Every affliction, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. The Lord said, Jacob's gonna go through some trouble. But he will deliver you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord shall deliver them out of them. what I want us to do we're going to pray for Jerusalem Jerusalem is at the center of all of this that enemy wants to make God out to be a liar because the Lord said he put his name there when he comes back to rule and to reign he's going to do it from Jerusalem and even right now just the, uh, just just a few, few a little while ago I saw them throwing rocks on a deadly encounter at Jerusalem. We're going to pray for Jerusalem. We're going to pray for Israel. We're going to pray that God would can, would keep them. That he would cause Michael himself to come down there. Keep them and protect them as much as he will allow. We're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. He said, come on, let's pray in Jesus' name. Jesus, oh God. Jerusalem is your heartbeat, oh God. They are your Rachel, whom you loved at the first. We thank you, Lord, that we are the Leah, whom you loved as well. But you had your eyes on them first. You came unto them first. And yes, Lord, they rejected you. But I pray today, oh God, that you turn your face to them again, oh God. Turn your attention toward them, O oh God. Let them come back, O oh God, to the land, O oh God. Put it in the hearts and minds of every Jewish person to come back to the land, O oh God. To come back to the land, O oh God. The land between those four rivers, O oh God, come back. And I pray, Lord God, as the enemy comes in like a flood, that you, O oh Lord, would fulfill your word, O oh God, and lift up a standard, O oh God. Lift up a standard, Lord God, against the enemy, Lord God. Cause every missile to fail. 
cause every attack to fail cause every army that comes against him to fail let them be a stumbling block oh God oh when my enemy came up on me they stumbled and fall let them stumble and fall oh let 10,000 fall by thy right side but it shall not come nigh thee oh let the arrow that fly oh God let it not touch him, O oh God. Let the angels get involved, O oh God. For the world has turned against him, O oh God. But we have not, O oh God. We recognize our natural brothers and sisters, Lord God. We recognize him, O oh God, that one day you will reveal yourself unto them. One day, O oh Joseph is going to reveal himself. And that day we will rejoice together, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you begin to reveal in me right now. Give them dreams, oh God. Give them revelation, oh God. Give them visions, oh God. You are the Lord that they are praying for. You are the God of the Old Testament. Manifest in the flesh. Save them, oh God. Heal them, oh God. Deliver them out of all of the trouble, oh God. Deliver them out of all their affliction, oh God. Cause your face to shine upon them. Turn, Lord God. And I pray right now for the church, oh God. Father, that you wake us up. That you wake us out of our sleep, oh God. Wake us out of our slumber, Lord God. Let the call go out in the midnight and the bridegroom coming the church rise up and trim our lamps <laughs> get the oil and get ready for there are wars and there are rumors of wars there is famine there is pestilence there is earthquake in diverse places <laughs> the beginning of sorrows has already passed ah, iniquity shall abound love of many shall wax cold sin is abound we're being delivered up to be killed, being afflicted. But you said, Lord, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. And every nation has a witness. Help us, Father, to be a witness. Help us, Father, to open up our mouths and declare your name, O God. To be a witness in this community. To be a witness in Tampa at our jobs, at our neighborhood, at our schools. Make us a witness, oh God. Make us a witness either unto salvation or unto judgment, but we need to be a witness. Give us boldness, oh God, to be a witness. Give us boldness to speak in the face of opposition and persecution. You said, and then shall the end come. We pray tonight, Lord God, for our strength, oh God. Let your joy be our strength, oh God. Let peace keep our hearts and our minds. Let the well of living water sustain us. Let the oil flow, oh God. Let the anointing destroy every yoke of the enemy, Jesus. Let your word be a lamp unto our feet, O oh God. And a light unto our path, O oh God. Let your spirit lead us, O oh God. Let it guide us in these dark hours. Help us to be the light, O oh God. Help us to be the salt of the earth. Help us, Lord. But without you, God, we can do nothing. You're the vine with the branches, oh God. Without you, we are nothing. Help us to abide in you, Lord God, and I pray that you abide in us. That we'll produce fruit, Lord God, and our fruit should remain. Fruit unto salvation. Fruit of righteousness, Lord. Fruit of love, and of peace, and of joy, and of faith. 
help us, Lord, to be unified. That there be no division among us. And I pray, Lord, that you'll come quickly. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly, come quickly. Save us, Lord. We're ready to see you, oh God. We're ready, we're ready, oh God. Come quickly, Jesus. And while you tarry, Lord, help us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We know that our labor is not in vain. Bless us, Lord. Keep us, O oh God. Strengthen us, I pray. Perform your will in our lives as we surrender and give you the glory, give you the honor, and give you the praise. In Jesus' name. to us tonight. Thank you for that word. And I want to encourage you guys keep keep on seeking the face of God. Amen. And I want to encourage everybody here seek the face of God. Seek the face of God in Jesus' name. Because <clears throat> very soon our Lord and Savior is coming. found asleep. We don't want to be found with our zeal lost. We want to be found ready and waiting and watching. I believe God in his
his mercy and kindness toward us, sending all the signs that we need to see him. The timing has come. And so I want to encourage you tonight. Keep walking the straight and narrow path. The Lord told Joshua, don't depart to the left nor to the right. Don't let that word depart from you. Keep living for God, doing his work, doing his will. Because very soon it will all be over. We'll have our reward. We'll be in heaven. And the Lord will wipe away every tear. We got plenty of tears right now, but that day there's not going to be no tears. Not going to be any troubles. No more affliction. No more pain. No more death. Death is swallowed up. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, glory, God. But we've got to endure right now. He said, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So yeah, it's going to be hard. It might be tough. But grab a hold to a brother and sister. And help him to carry that burden as we go forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Last reminder, we will be here tomorrow for prayer, 5 a.m. in the morning. So I encourage you to come out to that. And that goes Monday through Thursday for now. We may... We may increase it to Friday, and we may open it up at different times of the days because not everybody can come out in the morning. So I'm thinking about working out where we can have it in the evening too, morning and evening prayer here at the church uh, because we need it, we need it, we need it. Amen. And so this time we're going to close out in prayer, and you'll be dismissed in Jesus' name. Jesus, we thank you today that you've showed up in our meeting tonight, Lord, I thank you for the word that you've given and spoken to us through Brother Larry and, and Elder Ray, Lord God. And, and I pray that that word would be hidden in our hearts, Lord God, that we would feast off of it for the rest of this week, Lord. And I pray, oh God, that you would help us, Lord God, to walk according to your ways and according to your will, Lord God. And I pray that you help us to reach as many souls as possible before you come, Lord. We pray a prayer for our families and for our friends and for our community, for our neighbors, Lord, that you save them, oh God, that you bring them into this kingdom before you come, Lord, for you brought us into the kingdom for such a time as this. We pray that your will would be done in and through us, Lord. And as we leave this place tonight, I pray that you give us graces, Lord God, traveling graces and mercies to make it home safely, Lord, that we can come again in peace, Lord God. We thank you for all that you are and all that you've done. And I pray that you bless us, Lord God, and we'll be careful to give you the glory to give you the honoring, to give you the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen to the Lord tonight. Come on and clap your hands one more time as we're dismissed in Jesus' name. Amen. You are, you are dismissed. Love you. Greet somebody and tell them that you love them.